do it not, there are these two reference sheets, one page front and back. Um, you'll want to grab one of those. So I'll say a bit more about the reference sheet in a moment. Uh, but first, to, to uh, combat the claws of winter that have reached out and uh, dragged us back into uh, gray, cold, uh, I have some snow egrets. Uh, these birds once hunted almost to extinction for the uh, plumage to put in hats and so on, are now doing doing a lot better. So you can find big colonies, like 150 of these two foot long birds. Uh, and when you get that many birds together, uh, they don't always get along. Uh, so here we have some, uh, some egrets going at it, trying to be like, no, this is, this is my spot in the wetlands. Um, but, you know, pretty soon everything calms down and they're getting along again. All right, as for this reference sheet, uh, I've given you this paper copy. I encourage you to bring it to class. Number of useful things on it. Uh, if you want a digital version or if you lose it and want to get another paper copy, it's linked from the course uh, webpage under to a reference sheet. Uh, the top part has things about floating points, binary and hexadecimal, powers of two. Uh, there's been a long section about a bunch of different assembly instructions. We'll be talking about many of these over the next couple weeks. Um, and this will be a, a, a good reference um, when it comes time to do lab two. Uh, there's a table of different formats of operands we can give to assembly instructions. I'm going to talk about this and we'll do some practice with these operands today. Uh, next week we'll talk about conditionals in assembly, which is this table. And last we have the 16 general purpose registers uh, of the x86 64-bit architecture. Uh, and I'll say kind of more about uh, this table uh, today. And finally we have some C types, their size and bytes, and kind of, uh, a suffix that, again, something I'll talk about today, that we'll use to, to have an assembly instruction work with different amounts of data. All right, so that's the reference sheet. Uh, any questions on uh, the lab or the assembly stuff that we, we started last time? All right, so you may remember that we ended last time uh, talking about this swap function that took in two pointers and used those pointers to switch uh, the, the values of the, uh, uh, of the spots in memory where they point to. And we saw that this involved a set of these move queue assembly instructions in order to implement this swap. So I want to start off uh, by talking about what are these move instructions and how do we use them. So The basic form of our move instruction is we move from some source location to some destination. And even though it says move, it's actually going to copy whatever is in the source location to the destination location. So the source location is not changed by our move instruction. And this missing letter right here is the size specifier portion of this instruction. Because when we move data from one place to another, the system needs to know how many bytes it should move. Should it move one? Should it move four? Should it move eight? And that's what this size specifier is for. 
we have four different letters that can be here to specify uh, the four different sizes of uh, kind of basic data that we have. We have B, short for byte. And as you might imagine, that moves a single byte. We have W, short for word. That's going to move two bytes. We have L, short for long word. That's four bytes. And finally, we have Q, short for quad word, to move eight bytes. Anyone have a guess as to why W, word, is two bytes, even on our 64-bit system where we know a word is, is eight bytes? Backwards compatibility. Backwards compatibility is it. The original x86 system, the 8086, was a 16-bit system where a word was two bytes. And then when we got the 32-bit version, we still wanted to be able to run code that worked on the 16-bit version. So we had to keep the words, uh, the, the W suffix is moving two bytes and create a new suffix for moving four. And then when we got to 64-bit, again, create a new suffix to move eight. So, in our um, swap function, we had uh, move Q for all of these. We're moving eight bytes each time. Does anyone see why? Why is there something about the C code that would tell us we should be moving eight bytes around? Exactly. We're dealing with longs. We know that longs are eight bytes on a 64-bit system. And so to implement this code, we're kind of moving eight bytes in. Does that make sense? Questions on this? All right. So that's what's going on with move. But what is going on with kind of these operands over here. So for this, uh, I'm going to talk about different operand types. And these are the types of things that we can put in for the source and destination. So. We have what are called immediate values, which are integer constants. So for example, if we were to do move q dollar sign 7 percent rdx, this would copy the number 7 into the 8 bytes of register RDX. So that brings up our another operand type. We need to specify a register. Our immediate type can only appear as the source operand because we're never going to copy something to a like location and like an integer constant. That's not, that's not a spot in memory that we, can, that we can go to. But registers can be source or destination. So we can copy something from a register, we can store it in a register, uh, and we can copy from one register to another. So,
we could copy the contents of register rex into register rcx with move cube rx rcx. Uh, I should mention that the, these immediate values can be specified in hex or decimal. They can be, they can also be negative numbers as well as positive numbers. PJ. Is there a reason that we are still using the uh, sorry, you say that one more time? Yeah, it's a very idea of moving, using move, move to move forward to find the index of all these people. So, uh, we, I'm using move Q just for the sake of these examples. You could have move L, move W, move B to move different sizes of data. Uh, move Q says 8 bytes, so it's going to, this one, for example, will put the 8-byte integer representation of 7 into RDX. And this will copy all 8 bytes of RDX to RDX. Yeah, five. So the dollar sign is uh, The dollar sign is to identify that this is an immediate and integer constant value. Um, this almost never comes up, but if you look at... Uh, if you're referring to the table of operands on the reference sheet, you'll see that we can, the, um, the third row there, we could actually say, like move L7 RDX, so I've just removed the dollar sign here, and this says move four bytes from ad stored at address seven. So this dollar sign says treat this as an integer constant rather than a memory address. But you almost never see assembly instructions that just have a hard-coded memory address in them. Okay. Um, can you the um, dollar sign? You, you, you can do either both decimal and x, right? That's right. So then how does the how does the machine like determine that you're using actual and not actual uh, and not? Yeah, so uh, a hex number would need to be preceded by 0x. Otherwise, it will be interpreted as a decimal number. Yes, uh, so for immediate, like the value is bounded by what size is specified, right? The, the, the value of uh, Yeah, so uh, yeah, the value is limited by kind of how many bytes you're moving. And it's size in here? Uh, yes, it will be. Uh, you can specify a negative sign. If you don't, I actually don't know off the top of my head, could you write down uh, something greater than the largest signed integer, but within the unsigned integer, it would probably do the right thing in that case, but I'm not 100% sure. Other questions? All right, the last kind of addressing that we have, or operand that we have, is memory. We need to be able to move data to and from memory. And as I said, you can specify a literal memory address. Very unusual that the program would kind of always move something from the, the same address since addresses can change. So what is typically done is we'll use the value of a register as a memory address. So we can think of use a register as a pointer in effect. Say, treat whatever is in this register as a memory address, go to that memory location, and either read or write the data there. And the syntax for this is we put parentheses around the name of the register to say, basically, dereference this pointer and either use the data stored in memory at that location as the source or as the destination. So this instruction here says take the value in RSI, 
go to treat that as a memory address. Go read the eight bytes in memory there and copy those bytes to RVX. Uh, and this could be and we did this in the other order. We would say take the eight bytes of RBX, copy them to the location in memory, like given by the contents of our stuff. Yeah. So when you say copy the eight bytes of RBX, what what do you mean by that? Do you mean like the actual of like RBX itself or whatever is stored inside of RBX? Uh, I'm always talking about what is stored in the register. Like there's no there's nothing else. Like a register is eight bytes of memory, and so like the contents of a register are those eight bytes. Um, so I guess there's no, I'm not sure what what you mean by RBX, like RBX itself versus the contents of it. Like there is not those aren't separate things. Yeah. So I guess what's the difference between um, memory and register? Like you're moving RBX to parentheses archive versus moving RBX to regular archive. Um, so, what is the, the difference between these two? Yeah. Yeah, so let's say uh, RBX uh, has X10 in it. And RSI has X100. So this instruction takes the contents of RBX and writes it to the contents of RSI. So that changes this hex 100 to hex 10. This version says take that hex 10 in RBX, treat hex 100 as a memory address. And so this would change, we're going to write 10 to memory at address 100. So RSI is not changed in this version. Memory is changed at whatever address RSI specifies. Does that make sense? Fine. And then you said um, that for integers, it will take it as either if you put it in hex or you put it in depth. Yes, uh, our immediate can be specified in either hex or decimal, where hex you would put zero x in front of it. Okay, and uh, the that like that direct memory address thing is that always in hex then? Uh, no, it could also be in decimal. So again, we you will almost never see this in real code. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's see how this works uh, when it comes to that swap program or swap function rather. So here's our swap code, and in my role as the C compiler, this is something that the compiler determines. I am going to decide which register is going to store which variable. So for this example, I have decided that RDI will store the parameter XP, RSI will store the parameter YP, and that I'll use RAX for this temporary variable T0 and RDX for the tempor temporary variable T1. And that sets up a kind of picture of something like this, where RDI and RSI, they're storing these pointer values so that they are, in effect, pointers to some long stored in memory. And RX and RDX are going to store uh, just integers rather than, than memory addresses. Uh, but this is how we're interpreting these values. It's just kind of ones and zeros in the register. It's not kind of type information stored uh, anywhere. Uh, here, and so we can walk through what is this assembly going to do. So our first instruction, uh, I've kind of filled in some values now for the sake of this example. 
So I've decided that kind of this XP, the, the first pointer is address 120, and the number 123 is stored at that uh, address. And our other pointer is hex 100, which stores the number 456. So our first instruction takes RDI and dereferences that pointer, treats it as a memory address. And so we're going to go to address 120 and copy what we find there to RAX. So we go to address 120, copy the 8 bytes there to RAX. And that's implementing our T0 equals kind of dereference XP. So we can see how this sort of memory operand lines up with dereferencing a point. As our register stores a memory address, and we kind of dereference it with these parentheses. We have a similar treat RSI as a memory address. So that's one hex 100. Go to that address, copy the bytes there to RDX. Now we see our memory operands appearing on the other, uh, the other part of our move instruction, appearing as the destination. So now we're going to be changing bytes in memory. We take the contents of RDX 456 and copy them to memory at the address stored in RDI. So we're going to go to 120, copy 456 to there, and similarly take what's in RAX, copy it to the address stored in RSI, which is X100. Uh, through these four instructions, we have now swapped our two uh, uh, longs in memory. Does this make sense? Cool. Wait, so on the first two move keys, how do they not reference a pointer? And then after the second two move keys, they reference the actual value? Uh, so it's based on what operands we are giving the move queue. So in these first two, we have parentheses around RDI, which is saying, like, take whatever is in that register, go to that location in memory. That's our source, whatever eight bytes are there, and copy those to RAX. Uh, and we know we're copying to the eight bytes of RAX because there are not parentheses around that. Uh, and so again, we see the kind of parentheses lining up with kind of where we're dereferencing the pointer. If the destination of our assignment dereferences a pointer, we're sort of, uh, that's where we're dereferencing the register and kind of the other way around for when the, the source of our assignment statement is, is uh, dereferencing. Other questions on this? All right, so there are a few things I want to point out about uh, the kind of this particular uh, version of uh, swap. Uh, the first is uh, I've actually used uh, modified a few settings to get kind of this version of the assembly for swap. Uh, the first is just a syntax thing. Uh, for historical reasons, there are just two different syntaxes for x86 assembly. There's the one that Intel came up with. There's the one that at t came up with. And they're both used. They don't, it's simply how the assembly is written down. It has nothing to do with what the instructions do, how they function. Our textbook uses at t syntax, so I will use at t syntax. Uh, but by default, this godbolt.com uses Intel syntax which just, it's a different syntax, it looks different, same instructions. So I've gone in and unchecked the Intel assembly syntax option to get the at t syntax, which we will use. Bye. Um, what was that, what was that other, like, what did that other jump mean? Uh, it's a different way of expressing this exact same instruction. Uh, so the Intel syntax, uh, it has, the, it has the destination first and the source second, so the operands in the other order. And instead of parentheses to indicate treat this register as a memory address, it uses square brackets with this annotation of like this is a, quad, a pointer to a quad word. And you see that there's no move after the, there's no queue after the move. So it's like it's just sort of a different way of writing down these same instructions, and we'll use the the AT and T syntax. Um, that's what I'm. 
Maybe it's because that's what I'm used to, but I also find that uh, a little more readable. Well, and so the computers care about whether you're using at and syntax or um, initial syntax? Uh, not at all. I mean, it's going to need to be consistent within uh, a particular piece of assembly because it's going to be interpreted in, in one or the other, uh, but it compiles down to the exact same machine code either way. The syntax is simply how it is displayed for kind of humans to read. The other important thing here is I have this dash capital O G, and that is what's called a compiler option or a compiler flag. I'm telling this uh, uh, GCC, the GNU C compiler, uh, to use a particular amount of optimization. And in this case, I'm telling it do kind of a small amount of optimization that won't interfere with debugging, is what this dash OG means. If I don't provide it any option, it compiles with anti-optimization. It does a kind of strange transformation on the code to, as far as I understand it, facilitate if you wanted to use GDB and literally skip over lines of the C code. Just like jump to different places in the C code. This weird version of the assembly would let you do that, but it also is like not reflective of like what we actually care about in terms of how the computer system is, is functioning. So we will always look at assembly with at least this sort of basic level of optimization because this without this option, or if I tell it dash capital O zero, tell it do this like zero level optimization, it adds all this extra stuff, uh, which is for a like particularly uh, obscure thing you might want to do with a debugger. All right, um, let's do a little bit of practice. So I think what we'll do first is some of these. All right, so I'm assuming that there's some variable that's a long star pointer to a long called P that's stored in RDX. And then there's a variable x that's of type long that's stored in RCX. And I want to know which of these four move Q instructions would correspond to the line of C code star P equals x. Some votes for all four answers. Most folks thinking D, please discuss with your neighbor uh, why you chose the answer you did. Almost unanimous for D, that is excellent. That's what we'll do here. Can someone uh, share how you thought about this problem? Yeah. Um, so we want to change the value that the pointer points to to the value of C or of X. So the source should be the register that stores the value of X. And we want the destination to be um, the value in RDX treated as a pointer. So we copy the value of x to the value that the pointer points to. Exactly. We want our destination to be a location in memory, or a source to be the value in the register. So. Would this machine code do the same thing if it was move L instead of move Q? So, uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, we know it has to be move Q because X is an eight byte uh, uh, integer. So if we want to kind of move the full value of X, we need to move all eight bytes. Uh, but absolutely, if P was a pointer to an int and X was an int, we would see it use move L because an int is only four bytes. This actually brings up uh, a good point that in our swap function, if I were to change all of these things to ints, we see a few interesting changes. First, we see 
the move Qs have become move L, removing four byte integers. We have also seen that the destination where we're storing those integers, those registers have taken on a different name. So, this is uh, kind of one of the, uh, another one of these kind of backwards compatibility uh, situations where our first uh, x86 uh, architecture, it had a register called AX. This was a 16-bit register, and so it held two bytes, and so we had AX. And then when 32-bit came along, we, want, we needed the register AX to still exist, but then we also wanted a 32-bit version of it. So what they did was they created a register called EAX, extended AX, that was, so this was uh, two bytes, EAX, four bytes. And if we were to use percent AX, we would see, uh, we would be accessing just the lower two bytes of the AX register. So we have a name for part of the register EAX. And then in 64 bits, they just did the same thing again and created RAX. Not entirely sure what the R stands for. That is eight bytes, and we can use EAX to refer to the lower four bytes of RAX and still use AX to refer to the lower two bytes uh, of this whole thing. Uh, so we're in fact kind of using, uh, before we were using RAX, we're actually still using the same register, just using the name that only relates to four bytes of it since we're moving uh, uh, four bytes around. Questions on this? Okay. Um, since there's such a limited number of registers, what happens if you like define too many variables? Yeah, so it does seem like a concern that we have only 16 registers and we might have more than 16 variables. Um, so one way to think about this is that registers are for their really fast access. So what we want in the registers are the values that we are working with right at this moment. And say variables that we don't need anymore or that we won't need for a long time, it's okay if those aren't in registers. Um, where, in a, where do we put stuff on our computer system if it's not in it? Like where else can we put stuff besides the register? Memory. Memory. So if we have too many variables, some variables will certainly just be in memory and not in a register. And if we need them in a register, we would kind of move them, move them into one. So that's something that when we're running assembly, we figure out, but like, if you were writing C and you put like 25 variables, just like in I equals one and B equals two, like, would it just figure it out? Yeah, so the uh, uh, compilers are like big, very complicated pieces of software that people have kind of worked on and thought about for decades. And so it does a whole bunch of analysis of your program and figures out, at least attempts to figure out what should be in a register and what doesn't need to be. Um, but this does mean that when you are writing C code or any code, and it's a situation where you really need to care about performance, thinking about how many variables you are working with at any given moment and trying to keep that number smaller could make the, the program more efficient. Perfect. So then if you have less than or equal to 16 variables, are they always put into registers? Um, it depends. Uh, our registers are just eight bytes. So something like a big array or a struct can't go into a register. So some kinds of data will just be in memory no matter what. Um, but if we're working with a small number of variables and they're not kind of multi-part structures, 
then yeah, it's a reasonable assumption that they would all end up in registry. Other questions? Why do the registers here with um, uh, that appear inside these parentheses? Why are these still our eight byte names? Why didn't those change to our, our four byte names? What was that? You still need the eight bytes for the memory address. Exactly. We're still on a 64 bit system. Memory addresses are still eight bytes. So when we refer to, when we use a register as a memory address, we need to use eight bytes of it. All right. Let's do the second one of these exercises. Now I'm assuming that our register Rx holds hex 100 and RDI holds hex 80. Uh, and I want to have an instruction that will uh, write the, the, the decimal number 208, a great number, uh, to address hex 200. And uh, one of these four doesn't do this, but I realize what I haven't told you that you need to know for this is that when referring to memory addresses, uh, we actually have more, and uh, you will have noticed this if you've looked at the, the table on the reference sheet, there are more varieties uh, of ways we can refer to a memory address than uh, just using a single register. And so the kind of general form has four components, a a displacement, a base register, an index register, and a scale. And I wonder if this is the full form of a memory operand in assembly, why were we able to write parentheses just around a single register? Um, and that's because how a memory address is computed from this is our displacement plus our base register plus our index register times the scale. And each of these can be omitted from the operand. And a default value will be used in its place. So if you have uh, if you're familiar with uh, uh, the range function in Python or kind of list slicing in Python, there are different parts like the starting index of a range, the ending index of a range, the step size of a range. We can leave any of those out and some default will be filled in. Same applies here. So our default for our displacement is zero. So if we don't have one of these uh, numbers outside of the parentheses. We just use zero. Our, if we don't have a base register, that counts as zero. If we don't have an index register, that counts as zero. If we don't have a scale, that's just multiplying by one. So that means that when we have something like parentheses RDX, that's just the base register. And so all the rest of this is just treated as zero. Andre. Can you add the first three things before multiplying? Uh, no, the normal order of operations, so the multiplication would happen first. Other questions on this? Kevin. Um, this, like, this addition and then multiplication does use the memory, like, 
parameters and things, right? So that, um, that, that, that will give you the, the hack they did of like the long star. Yeah, this is used to compute the address, and then that's where you go in memory. Um, yeah, so this is all you've done to compute the address. Uh, this displacement is just a hex or decimal integer value. Uh, so, as you can see, kind of example, yeah, fine. Um, so I guess, why would you, why would you ever use this more complicated thing instead of just the name of a register? So, uh, we'll see examples of this kind of as we go through assembly where we absolutely need this. But just to give some intuition, uh, we can imagine that our base register has the address of the start of an array. And our index register has literally the index in the array that we're trying to access. And the scale has the number of bytes in each array element. And so we have start of the array plus size of each element times the index. And that's going to kind of get us to our array is a big chunk of memory, each element next to each other that will sort of get us to the point in the array where we're trying to go. Okay, and then and then this that array would be stored in actual memory instead of in registers. Yes, an array that like any multi-part structure can't be in a register. Registers can only be used for kind of a memory address or a single integer or uh, just a one one uh, one entity. Uh, and the intuition behind this displacement, we might uh, have an address of memory, and we know there are different things stored at kind of different offsets from that. So we can imagine a struct. The struct starts at some address, and its different fields are a certain distance away from the start. And so we might use this sort of displacement to kind of get to a specific distance from specific number of bytes from the from the start of a struct to get to a specific field. Other questions? Yeah. So that uh, in choice A, zero x two, and then parentheses. So that's pointing to the address. So it's saying like write two eight in that address. So is it dereferencing? That's right. So this is to compute the address, and then uh, and for these move instructions, we're kind of still then dereferencing to, to read or write that address. Uh, so in uh, these different options here, uh, we see different kind of versions uh, of our, our memory operand. So uh, feel free to refer to the, the table in the reference sheet. It kind of goes through all the different variations of these operands, the ways in which like different things might be left out, and gives the kind of expression how you would compute the address. Uh, and so think about which of these four would not have the destination as memory at address 200. All right, most, um, maybe a majority thinking A, but some votes for all four. Please discuss with your neighbors kind of how you're thinking about each of these four different uh, memory operands. Big movement toward A, excellent. That's the, the odd one out. Uh, what address will this version actually write to? Uh, I think it's LX102. Yes, exactly. Because we're going to add the 2 to our a, the value in RAX and use that as the address. Specifically chose this because the way this syntax is written, it looks like 2 is being multiplied by RAX. But it's always, you always add that number outside the parentheses. Can you go over B and D as well? Yeah, so. If we have RDI and four, we don't have D, we don't have the base register, so those are zero. So we just have our index register times S. So we have hex 80 times four. And 
if we um, uh, and a useful fact to know in hex is eight plus eight is ten because eight is half of sixteen. Uh, and so if I have four eights, that's the same as ten plus ten or twenty. So four times a is x two hundred. That makes sense. Uh, and then our last one, d eighty rx rdi. That gives us eighty plus one hundred plus eighty. Uh, which again, 80 and 80 will be 100, so this will also give us 200. Other questions? All right, let's talk about William Henry Harrison. A uh, couple of firsts uh, for this, uh, this gentleman. Um, first president to actively campaign to be president. It was considered improper uh, in the first few decades of US politics for someone running for office to act, go around actively you know, giving speeches uh, to be seen to be actively pursuing the office. So instead, that person's like friends and allies would be the people kind of going around uh, campaigning on their behalf. And the 1840 uh, election where uh, Harrison was running against uh, uh, incumbent um, Martin Van Buren. Uh, Martin Van Buren did kind of the normal thing, stayed at the White House, wasn't going around giving speeches. Harrison was, holding rallies, things like this. Um, so that was a first. Uh, and Harrison uh, uh, was criticized by the Democrats for uh, kind of not being very sophisticated. That you know he like uh, he was just like the, the candidate of like log cabins and hard sites. Um, but his campaign kind of embraced this image of like the rugged uh, frontiersman. Here is a kind of summary of of his accomplishments from the campaign. You know, the log cabin, the Patriots' home. Uh, he was a general. Um, most known for uh, a battle against a surprise attack. Uh, against Native Americans, uh, something called the Battle of Tippy Canoe, um, uh, a pattern that would repeat often throughout American politics in this period. Um, and so a lot of stuff about kind of military engagements. Uh, I think this is a cider press down here, kind of more log cabin stuff. Um, and it was sort of ironic because Harrison was uh, the son of a wealthy, uh, kind of wealthy Virginia slave owners, whereas his opponent, Martin Van Buren, had kind of been born into a family of modest means, kind of didn't have all these like wealthy connections, but was painted as sort of the elitist candidate. So Harrison wins, um, and his campaign uh, had uh, campaign coins, uh, campaign songs, They Might Be Giants covered this song, in fact, uh, campaign uh, porcelain. Um, however, uh, Harrison uh, went out in the, uh, uh, the kind of rain and cold, gave uh, the longest inaugural address in history. Uh, also important fact, at, the, at this time, the White House water supply was like downstream from Washington, D.C. sewage. Uh, so not, uh, not super healthy, uh, and whatever combination of these things, uh, Harrison was dead three weeks into his term. <laughs> uh, caught uh, uh, pneumonia, uh, had some intestinal problems, uh, and at this time, first time president had ever died in office, and it turned out the Constitution was just like a little unclear about what should happen. It said that the vice president assumes the duties of the president. And there was a disagreement about whether this made his vice president, John Tyler, like acting president, or did John Tyler become the real president? Uh, and his, Tyler and uh, Harrison's cabinet fought about this. Eventually, 
uh, okay, if Tyler takes the oath of office, he can become the real president. Uh, this set of precedent that would be followed many times before it ever actually got clarified in the Constitution uh, with the 25th Amendment. Uh, so that's, that's our, our first in American history for today. So uh, what I would like to talk about now is uh, kind of move from... Uh, move from just instructions that move data around uh, to instructions that uh, do do some uh, math as well. So I think I will move that up. Uh, so you can refer to the reference sheet for kind of all the different instructions, uh, many of which uh, are different kinds of arithmetic. Uh, some that I'll just mention in particular. We have the add instruction, which, as you might expect, performs addition. It takes two operands, a source and a destination. It takes the same kind of size specifier that our move instructions do, so we can add two things that are one byte, or two things that are two bytes, or four bytes, or eight bytes. Um, and we take the source, and we add it to the destination. And then we also store the result in the destination. So this means We're going to, after we perform the addition, overwrite the value of the destination with whatever the result of that addition was. So, if we have an instruction like add q dollar sign two to percent rbx, this says. Take the value in RBX, add 2 to it, and write that result, store that result in RBX. So this will overwrite the value of RBX with that value plus 2. Does that make sense? Uh, almost all of our arithmetic operations work this way, where they do the operation with the source and destination, and then store the result in the destination. Uh, so we have subtraction, uh, our, uh, we have subtraction, we have integer multiplication, there are separate instructions for floating points, um, because that involves kind of a different part of the, of the system. Uh, we have our kind of uh, bitwise operations as well, like XOR and or um, We also have uh, shifting operations. Uh, and for these, we have Uh, our right shift and our left shift, and then we have these are the arithmetic, and the ones with H in the middle are the logical shifts. Uh, now you might be thinking, left shift, what is is, is there a difference? No, these do exactly the same thing. Uh, but it does make it, it does matter for relationship. Um, and for these, we have, uh, uh, for, for all of these, they have, uh, they take the, am the amount to shift by first. Uh, so if we had, um, Instruction. 
function like this. We take the value in Rax, do a logical right shift by 3, and then store the result in Rax. Uh, and all the kind of all the different memory operands that we've been talking about with move also can be used with these arithmetic instructions. Um, one restriction that I have not mentioned is In x86, they made the decision that instructions cannot have both the source and the destination as memory operands. So, this would be uh, not a valid instruction because no instruction can have both the source and destination uh, as memory. Uh, so if we want to move from one memory location to another, basically we have to first move that value to a register and then from that register to memory. Uh, this design decision uh, simplify, simplifies some things about the actual structure and, and production of the chips by kind of uh, simplifying the, the pathways that data can take uh, through the system. Um, but it's not like it would be impossible to have instructions like this. There's just a trade-off involved in terms of you can make the hardware simpler, uh, but now you might have to like, do uh, extra instructions for uh, if you want to move from one memory location to another. All right. The thing that I would like to end with is talking about one more kind of instruction. And that is the LEA instruction. LEA the LEA comes from the name load effective address, but for our purposes. We're actually going to see it more often used for lovely, efficient arithmetic. So what is LEA? It's a binary, uh, it's an instruction that takes two, two inputs. Uh, it takes the source. And a destination, the source must be memory, what must be one of our, our memory operands. And the thing that's different about this is it's going to compute the source address. So it's going to, kind of whatever that memory operand is, it's going to do like the D plus the base register plus the index register times S. So it computes the source address. And it stores that address in the destination. So it does not actually go and read memory at all. It just computes the address. And so that's where the actual name comes from. Load effective address. It's in a situation where maybe you want to compute a pointer to some spot in memory for later use, then you might do this, but we can also use it to do uh, uh, some nice arithmetic. So 
if I wanted to you know, do something like uh, have x and it's going to equal uh, y plus uh, uh, z times 2 plus 15. And if I was using the kind of standard arithmetic instructions, I might need an add, I might need a multiply, I might need another add. And then maybe a move if I need to get that result into x, possibly, depending on how I structured it. But if I did, I could do all of this with like a single LEA. So my LEA with 15, and let's say that z is rcx, y is an rdx. So I could do, I want to do y, rdx, I want to do z times 2, rcx scale of 2. And so in computing this address, the LEA instruction will do this entire arithmetic. I want to store x and rix. I just make the destination rix. So I've kind of replaced all these arithmetic instructions with this single uh, LEA instruction, basically repurposing something that kind of is designed to kind of compute memory addresses to actually just do arithmetic for me instead. Would this only work though if you're given like the right and left? Uh, so there are some restrictions. Um, so, like, if I didn't have this plus 15, I could just remove this 15 here. Uh, if I didn't have the y, I could get rid of rdx here and just have rcx times 2. Um, so it turns out that LA is like very, very flexible. The compiler is very clever about coming up with ways to use LEA where you wouldn't necessarily expect. So it's like, aha, I can do these two arithmetic instructions with this like weird LEA instead, uh, and save an instruction. So um, the key idea here is that one is kind of a different application of this memory operand because it involves these additions and multiplications. Uh, and most importantly, LEA and move have a key difference. LEA just computes the address, doesn't actually read memory at that address. Whereas the same, if I were to make this a move instruction instead, it would compute this whole address and then go to memory at that location and try and copy that. So move will actually dereference a pointer. There's one way to think about it. LEA will not. It will just uh, compute a memory address without ever going to memory. Go. Can you change the memory address to like a probably but can you uh, can you put a arithmetic operation inside of LEA, like in front of the X? No, you are you are restricted to the specific format of, of the memory operand. Uh, so if folks have more questions, I'll be here for a bit. I have office hours starting at 3.30, but we're out of time for today. So keep working on lab one. Uh, the check-in post for lab one uh, due Friday, 9 p.m. And I will see you on Friday.